Galloway's Wow Wednesdays, getting the most out of your existing vision. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us this afternoon for our um, Galloway's Wow Wednesday Zoom session. This afternoon we've got Glenn, our eye clinic liaison officer, um, giving us a talk this afternoon. So over to you, Glenn. Good afternoon, everybody. As you can see, I'm, I'm in the hospital. That's why I've got the mask on. So right now I'm in, I'm in Royal Preston Hospital. Uh, the topic that I wanted to go over today was just getting the most out of your remaining vision. Or if you don't have any remaining vision, some options for, for accessing information as well. Um, so I'm going to go through some of these points. Um, and hopefully, you know, there'll be some snippets in here of things that you've perhaps tried or you've perhaps not tried. And it might be something that uh, you can give a try with, obviously, the support of us um, and see if you can get some more, get some more use out of that vision. Uh, so if we start off with so for your remaining vision, obviously there's there's a lot of people out there who have a visual impairment and have some useful vision, whether that's in the center, whether that's in the peripheral, whether that's some particular patches, whether that's on one side. And the idea is that through support of, a, of an ECLO or support of a sight loss advisor, you know, we'd start to look at what useful vision you have, and then try and focus in on that and get some more use out of it. So then once you've identified what your eye condition is and where that bit of useful vision is that you have, we'll then start to focus on some things. So the first thing that I would look at with an individual is, is lighting. You know, how is an individual managing with lighting? Is lighting okay at home? Um, quite often we would be recommended daylight bulbs or LED bulbs, something that's quite nice and crisp and consistent. Um, too many lamps and things, um, ambient lighting can be quite difficult for some people. You know, something that's going to potentially cast shadows and things like that um, isn't always ideal for an individual. So we'd, we'd look at lighting in somebody's home and try and make it so that it's nice and crisp and bright. Um, and as I say, the consistency as well is, is quite often, it's quite good if an individual can change bulbs so that you've got a consistent bulb throughout your property. So for example, you don't necessarily want to come out of your living room into your hallway and you've got different lighting and then in your hallway onto your stairs, you've got different lighting. It's, you know, it's, it's the potential for maybe not spotting a hazard or something like that, or maybe misjudging a step if you're going onto your stairs. So mm. often a recommendation could be, you know, make sure you change your bulbs and perhaps try and change several bulbs so you get a consistent lighting through your home. So that will keep things much safer for you. Um, also, in terms of if you're completing a particular task at home, maybe you're reading, maybe you need some lighting to support you when you're eating, Maybe when you're maybe when you're doing your your activities in the kitchen, you know, making a drink, preparing a meal. If you're somebody that feels that you do need more lighting in those areas, then there's different options of it could be a, a lamp, what we would normally call a, a task lamp, something where you can really focus the light on that area that you need it you know, to, to get the best use out of that lighting. Um, in the kitchen, that could be under counter lighting so that you're not blocking your own light by standing at your counter and you've got light behind you, so you're casting your own shadow. Um, a common thing could be getting, getting a bit more use out of natural lighting. So maybe positioning a, a chair in your living room where you want to complete a task so that it's nearer to the window so you can get some nice, some nice natural light on that. Or similar in a kitchen, you know, maybe swapping things around a little bit so that you're closer to your kitchen window. And then maybe that's where you make your cup of tea, where you've got some, some better natural lighting. So those are some, some quite common things in terms of lighting. So what we'll do is I'll, I'll go through various things. What I should have said at the beginning is if you have any questions, please save them till the end and I'll answer you know, your questions then. But what I'll do is I'll run through some other things for you. Um, so the next thing, to then consider would be colour contrast. Um, 
So there's lots of different things that you can do just to assist yourself and support you to, to again, get that bit more use out of your vision in terms of color contrast. So an example could be perhaps having, having different, different colors in terms of when you're in your kitchen. So when I say that, I mean maybe your work surface could be maybe a dark surface, but then if you've got your, you know, your kettle, you've got your, your tea, coffee, sugar, you know, your, your mugs and things, maybe then they're a light color. So they're an opposite color contrast to your, to your work surfaces or vice versa. Um, now, if that is something that does improve something for you, but maybe, you know, obviously it's quite expensive to change a work surface in your kitchen. An alternative that's usually quite easy and quite cheap is you can get, you can get what's called a Dyson mat. Um, so that's a different color. You can get a range of different colors of them. They're also anti-slip. So they're sometimes good for, they're sometimes good for doing a particular task on because they won't slip and slide around. And another thing could also be um, just using things like trays in your kitchen. You know, so your, your trays that you can serve dinner on, you can get those in obviously a variety of different colors. So something like, like that may assist you in the kitchen. You can get something that's a different color, so it makes things just stand out a little bit more. Sometimes a good thing for using a tray for making something like a cup of tea is any spillages and things is quite easy then to clean up. You know, you've just got to clean your tray rather than clean your whole work surface. Um, so it can improve things in that sense as well. A good thing is also in terms of colour contrast, um, you, know, you, you may consider things for um, steps in your home, you know, maybe having a, a coloured strip on the edge of steps, whether that's perhaps indoors or outdoors. Again, that just makes your steps stand out and eases the risk of not quite judging depth or missing a step and things. Um, so anything like that can improve in terms of the colour contrast. What sometimes helps some people is actually getting um, filters. So you can get filters in sunglasses. Um, obviously, Galloway's can provide your UV filters, so that can improve things for people in terms of just changing the colour and, and making things sometimes a little bit sharper. But you can also buy filters that's kind of like a, an A4 sheet that might be a different colour. Some people actually find that that helps things stand out in terms of if, if you received a letter in the post and you're struggling to read it, sometimes just a coloured overlay can actually make a difference and just make it a little bit clearer and a bit sharper for an individual. Um, so that's something that can, can make a difference. Something that makes a difference is obviously magnifiers. So there's a wide variety of magnifiers out there for, for lots of different types of tasks. You get a magnifier that's, that's for reading or just spotting labels and signage, magnifiers that can assist you with seeing things in the distance. Obviously, the ones that I've mentioned so far are generally all your sort of optical glass magnifiers, but then there's lots of different ones out there that are electronic magnifiers as well. So there's a whole huge range of magnifiers. Um, and the best option on, on those is obviously speak to us and we can assess and discuss what the best option for an individual is. Um, but there's obviously there's, there's lots of different types out there. <clears throat> there's, there's, some key, there's some key techniques out there. Um, now, when I mentioned at the beginning, when you assess an individual for what type of vision loss somebody has, and if you identify, so one example, if you identify if somebody's got central vision loss, so meaning that the peripheral vision is something that they're trying to make more use out of, so that vision at the sides, there's a technique called the eccentric viewing technique, um, which is mainly, you may recognize it in terms of if you do have central vision loss, someone may naturally start to to just look at things in a different way, just to try and get things into that, that peripheral vision. But what generally what tends to be happening is, rather than looking directly at the information that you're trying to read, you're basically just looking to one side of the information. Um, 
So for an individual, it's useful to then find out, you know, is it, is it better for you to view things on, on your left side or on your right side? And then once you've identified which is, which is a good window of, of peripheral vision for you to use, the technique can then be, can be mastered and, and you can do a little bit more training and try and just develop it a bit more because um, it, it is a difficult technique. You know, you are using vision that isn't really meant for seeing detail. Um, so you'll never get your peripheral vision to be completely 100% clear, obviously like your central vision, but you can start to adapt and start to use it. Uh, and like I said, the technique is called the eccentric viewing technique. So again, we can have a further conversation with, with an individual around that tip technique and try and help someone just identify is, is my left side better or is my right side better? And then just some ways of, of practicing it and having a bit more of a try of, of using it. Because the idea is to try and identify that area. And then once you start to get information quite clear, then you can make out the information. What the technique is then, it's around actually moving the information rather than moving your head. So the idea is you get your head in position so you can see the information and then you stay there so that you, you keep that, that window of vision focused. But then what you actually do is you move the information rather than move your head around. So, for example, if you're reading some information like a, a letter or a magazine, then you want to move that information. And an ideal is to try and perhaps use something like a clipboard so you keep that information nice and straight. And then you can you can move it around um, and you can improve on that technique perhaps with and um, there are apps out there that can help you improve it there are worksheets that can help you improve it and there are generally obviously different support options that, that you know galloways and, and obviously me as an echo we can have a conversation around and perhaps get some more support in those areas um, and a very similar thing is something called the, the steady eye strategy. Um, so similar to what I've just said there, it's, it's not just about your peripheral vision, but if you've got a good window good. of vision, good. The, idea, the idea is to try and get that window of vision focused and then keep yourself focused, don't move your head and, and move the information. So that part of it is called the steady eye strategy. So that could be for, for any form of, of vision loss. Um, so, for example, if somebody had diabetes and perhaps had quite patchy vision, you know, if, if you knew that you had a bit of a, a good window that's in perhaps your, your sort of bottom left, you would get that bit of your vision focused and get it so that things are quite clear. And then with the steady eye strategy, you move the information rather than move your head around. Um, another technique is called scanning, um, which is quite often something that is 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 useful for somebody who's perhaps lost um, partial vision. So quite commonly that could be somebody who's had a stroke and has perhaps lost one side of the vision. So the, the scanning technique is around getting an individual to, to look for. So for example, if I'd lost a lot of my vision to my left and I were making use out of my vision to my right side, um, which is kind of like you've lost half of your vision, but in both eyes. Um, and it's all missing to my left. What I am then doing with the scanning technique is I'm using that better vision on my right side and I'm scanning around more to my left to try and use that right side of my vision to compensate for what I'm missing on the left. Because what tends to happen is somebody with, somebody with, with vision loss to one side, commonly through a stroke, they tend to the brain forgets that there's information to the left. So for example, they would be looking at the page of a book and would potentially just be reading sort of the right side of the page and missing all the left side. Um, so the scanning technique is them actually continuing to remind the brain that there's information on the left. So the scanning technique gets them to, to see the information on the left and, and just keeps training the brain to, to make sure it soaks up the information. Good options for that is again there's perhaps some some apps out there that can help an individual there's also um some some worksheets and quite commonly the worksheets tend to be things like um, word searches and crosswords and puzzles 
So again, it's just making an individual look around on a piece of paper, on a, on a sheet, on a worksheet, to try and make sure that they scan around and soak up all the information to remind the brain that you know, there is a full page of information here. So those are some of the common techniques that, that can, be, can be learned for an individual. Another thing, quite, quite an obvious thing, uh, but sometimes people do need the slight reminder of it, is just, just maintain, maintain your eye care in terms of make sure you keep any glasses up to date. You know, if, if you can improve things to a prescription, obviously then, you know, getting your up to date glasses, obviously that will help you get the best use out of your vision. Also a common thing that sometimes needs to just jog people's memories around is just, just making sure that you do clean your glasses and things regularly. You know, if they do get quite, you know, fingerprints on them and get a little bit smudged and smear and things like that, then obviously make sure you clean them on a regular basis. You know, and then you, you're keeping your, your vision as, as clear and constant as, as possible. Another... Again, probably quite an obvious one, but again, I think sometimes it's good to just remind people in terms of alternative formats. You know, there's, there's lots of different formats that you can get information in. And quite commonly, if you're somebody who does have some useful vision, it's probably really good for you to get into a habit of requesting information in, in large print, or maybe asking if you have access to it. Maybe people send you information by email instead. Just getting into the habit, if somebody says that they're going to send you some information, actually requesting it in your preferred format. So you say if that's large print or if that's an email, um, obviously we've got audio and braille and things like that as well. But, you know, if you're, if you're trying to get good use out of the vision that you have, request the information. So that the common things would be, you know, your bank, inform your bank that you want your bank statements in, in large print. Um, inform your different utility bills, you know, your gas, your electric, your water, you know, send them some information, give them a ring and let them know that you want your information in, in large print. Um, and they, you know, they, they by law have to do that for you. And then it, it gives you obviously the, the confidence of you in control of your correspondence and you can confidently, you know, access that, uh, that key information. What I'm then going to do is just swap over to, you know, so if you, if you don't have, if you don't have some re remaining vision that you're able to actually get some use out of and you're struggling with, with accessing large prints or using a magnifier or lighting doesn't really make a great big deal of difference for you, then the best option to then start doing is rather than continuing to struggle and use your vision, which does get obviously does get frustrating and it can sometimes mean that you know you're not quite taking in all the information because you're continuing perhaps to, to struggle with a magnifier that's not you know it's not it's no longer suitable maybe your vision's deteriorated or something like that then the best options to start looking at are getting information in different ways so if, if you're going to if you're going to start to depend on perhaps some of your other senses um if you're, you know, if your vision isn't really giving you that, that information. Some of the common things to then look at is starting to perhaps be, starting to perhaps be a little bit more tactile. So, you know, if you're looking at an individual within the home, starting to maybe make things quite tactile. So, for example, in your kitchen, um, common things would be maybe getting some, maybe getting some uh, bump-ons, uh, obviously, very common thing, you know, Galloway's sell them. I'm sure there's millions and millions of them around the world stuck on all kinds of different things. So you'd be, be quite creative with them. The common things obviously would be to, you know, maybe stick some on the microwave, on your cooker, your washing machine, dryer and things like that. So you're just making things a little bit simpler instead of trying to struggle with your vision and make out what button is what or what dial is what. You know, the bump ons just make it tactile experience. So you you know, you're, you're using your fingertips to sort of feel what you need to do, and it can just make things a little bit quicker and a bit easier for you, and obviously generally a bit safer. Some other things, some other things then would be um, audio. So when I said a moment ago of being able to access information, 
um, in an alternative format. A common thing to, again, perhaps starting to get into the habit of is actually asking if people will provide the information on, on a CD or via a memory stick or that they have the ability to actually email you the information so you can take it in a different way rather than send you a letter that is then going to be something that you're going to have to get somebody else to read request it in these different formats so that you can actually soak in the information yourself similar obviously with things like like books you know if you still want to continue that love of reading look at accessing audio books you know there's lots of different ways of accessing audio books today whether that's CD, memory stick, whether that's through you know, a smartphone, whether that's through a computer, there's all sorts of different ways of accessing them. Um, and obviously Galloway is are fully up to speed with, with those different options and can, can discuss that with you. Some some other options are then a little bit more focused on, on technology. Um, so one of those would be um, text-to-speech. Um, so text-to-speech is basically something that converts text, whether that's physical text that could be a letter in front of you, or whether that's text that's perhaps on a computer screen. There's different ways of having that converted into speech. Commonly, it's through a screen reader on a computer. Or if it's if it's a hard copy of some information, there are different perhaps apps and, and there's other options as well. But the more common these days tends to be an app. So obviously it does mean you have to have some access to some smart technology or a laptop or something. But what you can basically do is, so for example, you know you, you get your information in an email, you can then convert it to text with using a screen reader. Uh, obviously there's much more to it, and obviously we can support somebody to, to do that type of thing on a computer but it does mean obviously you can start to take some control of, of information yourself and similar with the hard copies of some information it could be a letter comes in the post you open that letter and you can use an app to just scan that document and then it will read out loud it will turn that text into speech uh, and then you can access it yourself and again you know we can we can support an individual to look into more detail on, on that and doing that. Another that's then progressing in such speed is, is artificial intelligence, being able to use things like a smartphone to, to take a, a picture, take a scan of something and convert it into some information. So for example, taking a photo and having that photo converted into a description. Um, Having information um, like a, you know like a banknote quickly converted and, and it will tell you what a banknote is you know colours something that will identify and tell you what the colour of an object is um, so quite useful sometimes for an individual who perhaps wants to you know be matching clothes up from the wardrobe you know you can quickly scan some some garment and it will tell you what colour it is um, and the artificial intelligence is something that. You, know, you can get different apps and things on smart technology, but then you've got access to that in your pocket. Um, and like you say, you can then convert things that generally perhaps you can't see very well into some form of description or it will speak out loud and, and just, just tell you that information. So again, it's, it's using these techniques to just give you some control, help you maintain that independence and stay in control of, of that information that you, you want to have access to rather than having to be quite you know, dependent on an individual to, to do it for you. So all of these different things that I've gone over, I've given you a snapshot of that. You know, let's, let's try and support an individual to make more use out of the vision, or if not, let's look at some alternatives to, to help you adapt and develop and get that information in perhaps a different way. Um, so what I would do now is, is obviously open it up and, and see if you have any questions. Anybody got any questions on what I've, what I've gone over? Um, now, what's the situation? When you register as uh, severe sight impaired, that registration is attached to the area you live in, isn't it? So if somebody moves out of their home county 
into a new county, have they not got to re-register as severe sight impaired? They don't have to re-register, but the idea would be that they can inform the local authority either before they're moving or once they're moving, and then yeah. the local authorities communicate and can, can transfer that across. Because you are oh, right, right, you know, when you're registered, you're registered with your local authority. Um, yeah. But if you move authorities, it doesn't mean you have to re-register. You would just oh, request right. that that information be, be transferred across. Because at the end of the day, a certificate of visual impairment is obviously what gets an individual added to a register. Um, now, it's the patient, it's the service user, it's the visually impaired person themselves who, yeah. whose document that is. You know, that is your legal document to state, you know, your, yeah. your visual situation. So they can request that that be transferred across. Without seeing a doctor? No. Without seeing an eye doctor? No, they don't right. need to see somebody again. You know. I mean, as long so as the individual themselves, way. as long as the individual themselves is comfortable with the registration status, like you say, whether yeah. they're registered as sight impaired or severely sight impaired, as long as they're comfortable with that and aren't feeling like, you know, they, they would rather have a second opinion or something like that, as long as they're comfortable, then obviously they can just transfer across the CVI and they will be registered with the new authority. Right. And then what's the situation with the bus pass? Because, again, that's a local issue. Would she have to see our site advice, one of our site advice? Because that's not really an actual thing, is it? Um, and any of us at Galloway's... Yeah, any of us at Galloway's would obviously be able to support an individual with that um, yeah. and then point them in the right direction to apply for a you know, for a new concessionary pass, you know, on this authority. It goes off priority, um, which right. obviously, if needs be, we can help, you know, if we feel that someone should be more of a priority in terms of the needs, then obviously we can assess the person's needs and then we can put that referral through, you know, if we feel that somebody is at risk of, you know, perhaps, you know, falls if they're generally feeling unsafe in maybe the new property and need some support in terms of, you know, orientating, maybe they need some support in terms of, you know, starting to find their way around to, you know, to bus stops, to local shops and things, you know, and they're needing that mobility support, so then, you know, yes, we can put priority referral through. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I've got macular degeneration. <laughs> my right eye is no good. I can't see at all with my right eye. My left eye is okay. Uh, I do need magnifying glasses sometimes, you know, but I can't see. And what you said, you know, to let people, other people know, I haven't let, like, banks and building society and insurance people, you know, I, I, that's a good point. I'll, I'll uh, contact them and tell them to give me large print. Yeah, yeah. So do you find that with your left, your left eye, are you able to see large print information? Yeah. Yeah, good, good. So like you say, requesting it in large print will, you know, prevent you from, from struggling with accessing that information. Because like you say, your bank statements, your utility bills and things, it's, you know, it's, it's private information. You don't necessarily always want to have to show somebody else so that they can read that information <laughs> for you. Yeah. I've got it on email, so I can put, put it on large print, you know on large yeah. font so i'm not too bad with the, uh, going on the thing uh on the email i can read that but sometimes you know you paperwork. do need yeah you do need your paperwork in in paper format because you've got to take it elsewhere and what have you and they want to see the actual physical copy of it so yeah and the other thing glenn talked about before was overlay so i've got a yellow overlay here it's not very easy to see on the camera because it is almost very clear it probably looks very distorted now but if i put that over july's galloway eye it's now yellow it won't be very easy to see here because of how light it is in my living room but when i put it on my desk because it's dark on my desk um that makes it a lot easier for me to read there you go david i've just held it back up for you yeah again. i could just about see just see it yeah, yeah. In, the, in the top in the top right dial yeah, yeah. Right. you know it, and i've you. just got these from an ordinary stationers um yeah. blue 
blue, pink, whatever colour works for you. It doesn't have to be yellow. Yeah, I'd strongly recommend if you haven't had a try at seeing if you know different colours make a difference for you. You know, ha have a try of it, like you said. Yeah. Jenny's options with the overlays for for hard copies of information, but like you say, David, as well, there's options of you know just on your particular device, whether that's your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your desktop. Oh yeah, computer, there is. Yeah. They all have the yeah. ability to just change your colours, and obviously for some people it it makes things stand out a bit more, and it's sometimes a bit easier on the eye if you've got you know a dark background with some white writing on it. You know, well, yeah, I always do white yeah. on black, uh, white on black or yellow on black, but that's me. I mean, that won't suit anybody. I was just going to, to um, make the comment that we are on a journey with our site. Um, yeah. um, uh, and you can get set up with everything you've suggested, but as time goes on, they maybe don't work as well. And mm -hmm. for example, mm -hmm. large print, I went... Mm -hmm to large print and that was great bank accounts and all that kind of thing large yeah. large print letters and that was fine but now i find uh, that's a struggle um yeah, okay. even with a magnifying glass but what now works for me is i've had to go on with technology and unfortunately the more expensive technology but i've got um the optelec hd10 uh, yeah. which has the um, an, an angled camera that comes out and you can photograph the whole page and synaptic do a similar reader um, and so then you want to go back to the normal size print and then that is photographed up and read to you and is a better option than the large print so life is a journey through different methods isn't it yeah absolutely because like you say you may find something that works um like you say, that there are eye conditions that are progressive and obviously can deteriorate. So you say it's it's useful for everyone to know that obviously there are lots of other options, as, as obviously I've discussed. So like you say, if you're somebody who's dipped in and used some of our services and it is fine for the moment, you know, obviously there's no harm whatsoever in dipping in again just to look at some alternatives. And like you say, whether that's transferring perhaps from you know, hard copies of information and maybe going a little bit more electronic with technology, you know, again, we can we can help people just dip the toe in the water and try and see if that makes a difference for them. Yeah, and that also applies to going back to your consultant, going back to the ECLO, going back to social services, to the rehab team as well, because mm. you might not have needed um, any assistance at the time when that initial contact was made, um, but later on down your journey, you might need that. Mm. So, yeah, really good point, Kay. Thank you. Yeah. And I think from, like you say, our perspective as professionals as well, things change quite often. You know, there might be a new piece of equipment comes out, you know, a new, a new app, a new piece of technology, or just, you know, some new information around certain eye conditions. Um, so, like you say, dipping back in and getting some more up-to-date information from us obviously we you know we, we might have some some new piece of information that might just you know help you that little bit more with with day-to-day with -day life um so like you say from our perspective it's sometimes good that people get back in touch you know i, I do see people in clinic at times and you know as, as i'm assessing and we're having a conversation and i say you know have you had some support from galloways you know sometimes people will say oh i'm fine you know i have had some support from galloways but then it's perhaps you know, a year, two years, three years since they've had that support. And obviously from, from our perspective as professionals, there's, there's a lot changed in three years. You know, there's new services, new equipment, new technology that, you know, obviously we want to try and inform people of. So like I said, just a fresh assessment, getting back in touch is, is always useful. Fantastic. Has anybody got any more questions? It, well, it's not so much a question. It was just something that was running through my mind as to what I've seen over the years uh, when people request information in different formats. I know somebody said something about insurance policies. They can be very long to get an insurance. I know the law is for uh, the, you know, you are entitled to your information in the right format. Uh, but I would think an insurance company, that could be harder to pull off with uh, anybody wanting insurance policies in, in large print. Email, they might be more lenient to do it. 
I suppose. I think in those situations, David, obviously that's where we can offer support because, like you say, we you are fully entitled to challenge that. You know, if somebody said that they're not willing to provide you some information because, you know, if they have an excuse of, well, it's going to cost us more to, you know, print 50 pages instead of 30. Um, yeah. Like you say, by law, you can challenge it because... You know, somebody with a visual impairment, they, they can't, especially they, they if can you're be. registered, you're covered under the Equality Act and you're entitled to ask for a reasonable adjustment. The insurance company do send uh, uh, a big booklet, send me a light print booklet. Yeah. You know, yeah, so I would expect they some do, of your bigger, your bigger mainstream insurance that obviously, like you said, is going to be... Um, straightforward you know they'll be used to people requesting that information you know you may have to challenge a bit more maybe if it's a small independent insurance company um, but like you say again if if you're needing support to access that kind of information you know again you know we, we can help challenge that stuff fantastic any more questions for glenn good We've just got to say thank you very much to Glenn um, for a very informative session as always. And we look forward to seeing you next month for our Eye Health and Nutrition.